Hey folks, it's 5.40 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6.27-2019, I'm told. I've been thinking for a while now about what it is I'm even going to talk about. Uh, yeah, ever since I wrapped up those history, fiction, or science videos, those were difficult to wrap up. Because one of the side effects that I'm having to deal with and, and try to get past is the these this severe problems in in my abdomen having to do with my guts how much the uh, the chemo the effects that it had on my heart and lung function which was pretty serious and uh, it was not well known to me until I got all the prednisone out of my system the prednisone was actually masking a great deal of the effects uh, that the chemo was having uh, on my body and my mind. And these things I didn't know. I wasn't necessarily warned about them. So finishing up those history, fiction, or science readings, they're pretty tough because what would happen is um, when you talk, you use muscles in your abdomen and you use the the solar solar plexus area and that's where I've been having so much uh, trouble is in my abdomen and it would just get increasingly more and more painful as I would talk for hour hour and a half whatever time it would take to do those so since then mostly I've just been continuing with studies I've been doing making tables uh, I've been working on a table on and off for over a year and it's a table of lands and the peoples that are either in the the promised land, so Canaan, um, or around it. And you'd be surprised how big a list that is. Now, it's in three sections. One section is in or, or directly bordering on. The other section is near, but perhaps not bordering on. And the last section is far from. I'm still on the in or near to part, currently working on Mitzrim, which this is the second time around I've had to go back over Mitzrim. Because when I started on this table, I had a really different outlook on the language and I took a lot of passages uh, in the Bible at face value their English translations that is and I didn't spend a lot of time going back to those passages and looking at the source language and rethinking it and now that I'm doing that with each passage it's making a lot of this far more in depth and of course it's uh, it's it's taking a lot longer, obviously. But it didn't really it wasn't really giving me much of any material to to offer anybody, and I've just been bouncing back and forth from that to uh, it's a a table that is basically every single two glyph parent word in the lexicon uh, contained in the Old Testament and trying to uh, determine the absolute meaning of those two glyph parent roots. Um, now most people have this idea that most words in Hebrew, or at, actually Obri, are about three glyphs long, and that everything kind of uh, builds off that. I haven't found that to be the case. Now, there are a great many that are three glyphs long, um, but there is a very large number that are only two glyphs. So, you want to start there. Um, most other words that are three glyphs, you can see how they're based on, uh, for the most part, the, the two glyph uh, words. So besides bouncing back and forth with those, there is uh, the monumental 
task of figuring out um, all the best, most pertinent information for my next installment of Mormonism is Judaism. And <clears throat> besides the fact that I've realized that it's very difficult to read all of these books on screen, and it is. Um, uh, and it's not just a screen thing in my eyes. At first it was. The side effects that I've dealt with since the last infusion. It's hard to even explain. But one of them was definitely trying to read uh, a, a computer screen. It got to my eyes so fast that there was just very little, you know, I could do at one time. Um, books are kind of difficult sometimes to get through um, in an electronic format too and I don't it doesn't matter it, you know I, I read most of mine from PDFs and I have Adobe Acrobat DC and it's very good you know what the what you can do with it and you know you can gear PDFs all to um, uh, all in a certain way that make them very easy to edit, uh, easy for like copy pasting. You can do a lot with them, and you can turn a lot of things into PDFs really easily. Web pages, for instance. So it's really great. And I've worked with other digital uh, book or literature tools formats, and I don't find any of them that much more superior. I really just think there's a disadvantage to reading books uh, on a computer as opposed to having them in your hands. Uh, and it's harder to erase those actual books uh, than it is to erase just digital files. So I, I find that to be a disadvantage too. But I did finally come upon something that I thought this might be a really good um, addition to or precursor to some of the other material that I'm going to be looking at having to handle uh, in the future. So the, the whole reason that I started the Mormonism and Judaism thing, or started even looking into Mormonism, was because, and this, this is a lot of the reason I started looking into falsified history. For me, I can't trust the mainstream version of history mostly because of two very large land masses that you just absolutely cannot get around. It is impossible to think that the world could, for the most part, just ignore the Americas up until 500 years ago, 600 years ago. Solomon, the third official king of the united Yisrael. So we're talking about... Uh, we've got to be talking about around a thousand, we'll say about around a thousand BC or so, we absolutely have Solomon having a merchant fleet of ships traveling the world. And it took them essentially three years to go to the one to two lands they would mostly go to and come back. That's, that's big. If you believe, the, if you believe this stuff happened in the Middle East, then you have to wonder, how did it take three years to go where they were going and come back? But it didn't happen in the Middle East. It didn't happen in Africa. 
It didn't happen in Asia, it didn't happen in Europe. The most likely place that these events happened is North America. And I've been keeping a list of evidences of that. And it just gets bigger and bigger all the time. It is quite literally the North and South American continents that make me disbelieve establishment history. You can't not know about these things. When a sailor gets in the ocean, <clears throat> there have been so many stories about um, ships that have lost their um, ability to navigate or their ability to sail uh, that have just been carried on the currents that are naturally in the ocean. The ocean is full of highways. The oceans are not a barrier to travel. Don't ever think of them like that. They're not a barrier to travel. The oceans are the world's highways. That's how men travel from place to place. The oceans. All you gotta do is get on an ocean, the Atlantic, and there are currents that'll take you right to North America or South America, the Caribbean. You can get in the Pacific and there are currents that will take you to the Americas. It's unavoidable. Now, the silly ideas that the Americas were heavily populated with very primitive, ignorant people that happened to get on some rafts one day and were just carried here by the currents. Yet, the developed, advanced peoples of the world for thousands of years, uh, they just missed it, I guess. It's, it's the most insane way of thinking that I can even imagine. World history without the Americas from the longest time ago is, it's unthinkable. It's just insanely unthinkable. Now, there's areas where you can justify them being more obscure. The so-called North Pole, Antarctica, there's some justification to the obscurity of these places simply because of things like extreme temperatures. Fine. You don't have that with the Americas. There are two huge land masses that you don't get past. You, you can't ignore them. The history of the world can't be written without them. It's funny because so many of these establishment folks that when enough artifacts are uncovered in America, they always have to backtrack and they'll, they'll come up with, they'll give just so much uh, and then that's it. And they're, they're getting to a point, and they've suppressed this stuff immensely. They're getting to a point where, okay, they'll admit that um, perhaps Phoenicians, as they're called, sailed here a long time ago. But the Americas aren't part of Phoenician records. Sometimes some establishment folk will admit to Romans or Egyptians coming to the Americas. But none of that is in their records either. These records that very dubious individuals have found in various locations in and around the Middle East and and that is a whole other subject for some some other video 
those people. There's there's one or two guys, I would say maybe about three, who are credited with most of the fines from Egypt to Mesopotamia. And when you start looking at these these people and their affiliations and the fact that at least two of them went on to very successful political careers after that. Guys, come on. We gotta start thinking about these things objectively. Okay? So the Americas are a very big problem. And for all the people who scoff at my theory that all of the events that are described in the Bible would have had to have happened in North America. It's the only suitable place. Then you're going to have to start dealing with a massive amount of questions and problems. One of the problems is how much energy and time and money has been put into covering up artifacts found in North America. Um, and how many establishment people have gone out of their way to write um, clearly hit pieces on archaeological sites that can't be covered up? We don't see this as the case anywhere else. When you start realizing who's running things and understand then that they publish like crazy anything having to do with Egyptology, anything having to do essentially with the Levant area archaeology, which is some of the most bogus archaeology I've ever even heard of. And they'll publish all kinds, and we're talking about television, books, etc. Magazines. There's a whole magazine dedicated to Palestinian area archaeology. Um, and then Mesopotamia. They publish this stuff like crazy. You can turn on any major uh, channel, um, the History Channel, the Discovery Channel, and so on, and many different public television, which is very funny. They still call these things public television. The public really gets no voice on there. And, and they're some of the most liberal uh, toilets that there are is these public broadcasting but you turn on them um, and they're constantly shoving things down your throat uh, archaeology from Egypt the Levant area to Mesopotamia we know who's running things we know that only things they want you to see is going on those networks and being published <clears throat> so the thing is, if the Americas didn't present a monumental, I mean a mountainous, potential problem for them, you'd be hearing all kinds of stuff about America. The only, the only stuff we even get from these major networks are controlled op guys like uh, Walter, what's his name? And then, you, you, sometimes you'll get specials by um, Childress. And the thing is, and I've got a book that I've read most of in the last day or so. And it's up in my uh, uh, Acrobat DC right now, and I'm going to be reading some of it. Even, even these guys who wrote this book... Even guys who purport to be alternative archaeologists, historians, and so on, they still can't cope with, or, or they're just so brainwashed, or they're just controlled op, 
like the couple of guys I mentioned earlier, who I don't trust at all. Um, same thing with um, Barry Fell, who everybody thinks is just such a maverick, but the conclusions that he comes to, I think, are just as loose and spurious in connections he makes and the translations that he offers and what he says he believes those things mean. They're just as um, inconclusive and non-concrete as people trying to take obscure names and titles of things or people from, uh, like, say, the Merneptah Stella and saying that that absolutely has to be talking about the Hebrews. Uh, there has been so much latitude given to people, not only in Egyptology, but people who purport to fluently read uh, Phoenician or other old languages, which are purported to be found on all kinds of artifacts found in North America. And I'm not going to talk extensively about artifacts found around Mexico or South America just yet. We're mostly concentrating on North America. There's plenty to be said about Mexico and South America too. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, not as much as about North America. you got to understand, this land, more than any other land that I'm aware of, more national parks and so-called national forests, places that are supposedly under the protection of the government, and sometimes UNESCO, um, I know of no other place that has as much land that basically... The powers that be have said, we're controlling this, and we say what happens here. We say who can go where and what can be done here. Now, the, the couple of things that precipitated this was that I found out, uh, as strange as it was, <laughs> from a David Hatcher's Childress, uh, it, it was part of a series, a very obscure series, where he talks about, you know, alternative viewpoints in archaeology, uh, and thus the history of the Americas. But he always has to bring it back to a more mainstream view that the people that we call Native Americans... I just call them Indians because we don't know that they were native. We just know that they were here when a lot of people started sailing here from Europe. And the thing is, they're, they're not um, a homogenous people. And we'll find more out about that as we go. This, there's this mainstream idea that the, the American Indians were sort of always here or here since i mean they'll give they'll give wild ranging dates sometimes from hundreds of years ad to thousands of years bc and as i was saying even the so-called alternative archaeologists and historians and so on uh they still are keeping alive the, uh, I, I just think, the silly, foregone sort of conclusion that those American Indians were sort of always here, and the thing is they just had interactions with other peoples from other places. Sometimes they'll talk about maybe Chinese artifacts, or you'll hear about maybe Chinese coins just on the very western part of the west coast. But, and here's where I think the crux of the problem is and why so much time, so much money, so much effort, uh, and so much 
just land theft that the federal government and private institutions and international institutions have done and gone to to steal land in America under the auspices of we are protecting it. The lengths that they have gone to, in my opinion, based on everything I've seen, is because they're desperately trying to cover up the fact that some of the oldest inhabitants here are what are called Caucasians, white so-called Europeans. Now, it's not as though I think <clears throat> there weren't whites so-called in Europe um, for, you know, a long time, like that there were no whites in Europe and that they were all here and then they dispersed to Europe. I, I don't exactly know. I think Europe was at one time mostly full of Japhethites, maybe some Hemites, uh, though it seems like some Hemites would have migrated southward in the Americas. Um, most of the Japhethites, I think, actually headed over the Pacific. And I'm going to give reasons why. You see, one thing you'll see over and over in the Bible is this term that is translated as islands or islands of the sea. And it's always this very tiny two-glyph parent root, I. A, and we'll call it Y. Um, I, you know, I, I approach Obery very similar to the way that the German alphabet is. The German alphabet, every uh, letter or glyph is, um, it's named its pronunciation. So you have A, B, Z, D. So that's the same way I pronounce Obery. So you've got A and E, which is kind of like our Y. I. And you'll see frequently, um, I yum. Uh, oftentimes translated as like, they'll call, they'll say the islands of the sea. Now, I, uh, uh, appears in about four to six different entries in Strong's. But when you look at them all, you can knock out a few of them right away as ridiculous uh, translations and you can put all of them together and figure out that they're talking about the same place and the same thing. Now sometimes you'll see ayim um, but frequently you'll see ay and the way it's used and when you consider that mostly when the sea is being talked about even though we know that there is this yum soup, and yum soup has to have some sort of outlet to the oceans and seas of the world because that's where, for instance, Solomon put his merchant navy at. However, for the most part, the I I believe the reason that sea and west are both yum in the Bible is because everything to the west of this land where this was occurring was sea. Now over in the Middle East you can't go down to Egypt which they say is Mitzrim which is impossible and have Yam still be sea. Yes it's true any land any continent that you get on if you go far enough west you'll hit some sort of sea. That's true. However if you pay close attention to the Bible's geographical narrative, you'll see that Yam e Gadul, the Great Sea, was the west of about everything. So we're looking for a land where the sea is the west of everything. Now, over that sea, Again, 
These are things you have to pay attention to when, when reading the narrative of the Bible. That is what is so often being referred to as I, I, Yam, or Aim, and often translated as like the islands of the sea. I find it very curious that the place directly west of America, across the Pacific, is a place called Asia. It would have a very similar root with a sort of Greco-Latin suffix. Um, but that's not the only thing. I wrote of in one of my papers, probably the land of Amory, how peculiar it was that some major places in the world have roots of biblical names with simply uh, a Latin Grecian suffix to them. Take, for instance, Africa. If you break that down into Opir, you have the land of Opir, where Solomon's merchant navy frequently went to get things, because it was obviously uh, a place that was relatively open where these uh, merchant travelers were not uh, encountering a whole lot of opposition or resistance. And you have to consider that up until, you know, um, European countries started at least publicly pulling out of African countries, which, by the way, and giving them back to African tribal warlords, which made things infinitely worse for the people there. Um, and in, in, except in the case of, of the Zulus, there was very little resistance, even for the Europeans that colonized Africa in the last five, six hundred years or so. You have this land of Opir. This is where the uh, Tarshish Navy that was Solomon's merchant navy were sailing to which they would come back it would take them a couple of years you add an ICA to Opir and you get Opirica Africa the P's and, and a PH sound which is often just pronounced which is always pronounced F appears all the time as a switch Opir Afir, Ika, Africa. So, I won't continue to digress into that. However, it did catch my ear that on one of these specials that David Hatcher Childress did, he mentioned something interesting. Now, I had known about the Grand Canyon Caverns where it is purported that these were very large caverns that were found with, in some cases, many, many, many uh, quote-unquote Egyptian-like sarf sarcophagi were found and artifacts. It is, and there, there, there's so many varied stories. Some stories say there were uh, chambers full of weapons and uh, others saying there were chambers with, with a lot of pottery, uh, coins. The stories go on and on. And the thing is, uh, it, it was for a long time that these snot-nosed intellectuals would deny all of it and say that it was complete crap for, for people to, uh, for guys like, say, Childress or other alternative archaeologists and historians to um, purport that the, the Smithsonian perhaps covered up these finds. Uh, however, just recently, the Smithsonian was sued in federal court for covering up um, bones and remains of giants. And now this, you, you won't hear this covered in any major 
media source, not television or, or newsprint, uh, the Smithsonian was found guilty. And they were ordered to pony up all of their records concerning giants. That's unfortunate because it ought to be just all of their records. And here's the kicker by the year 2020. So the, they'll have plenty of time to redact things and rewrite things and cover up all, all kinds of things. They have time for all of their people to pour over these records and try to omit anything extremely damaging to them. Uh, the Smithsonian has, has shown time and uh, time again that, that they are not subject to the laws of the United States. I was baffled to see that there was actually a judgment against them but you have to consider the the judicial in this country as corrupt as most of them are they have to keep up a semblance of justice and you know democratic whatever so that people don't you know just in one voice rise up against them and say enough's enough depose them and institute a better system so they have to keep up the guise that the system is good and that it works. So sometimes you do get these judgments um, against people and organizations that you don't think you should. And keep in mind, the Smithsonian have been pretty much entirely federally funded since the um, since right around the time that uh, the prophet Joseph Smith Jr. was supposedly murdered by an angry mob in Illinois. It's been that long, federally funded. So anyways, for anybody who thinks that, that those are just silly stories, that they're conspiracy theories, well, uh, a federal judge didn't think so, and he thought there was enough information to convict them on covering up at least the existence of giants in North America. Um, they probably got off very easy, very lucky, that the giant remains that they've covered up, destroyed, lost, uh, suppressed was the only thing that was on the table. Turns out that these caverns, that the Phoenix Sun reported on this in, in 1909, and, and two archaeologists who were said at that time to be working directly for the Smithsonian, which since the Smithsonian denies that they ever worked for them, by the way. Anyways, None of this stuff would have been known about, I suppose, if it hadn't been, and this is basically the official story, it was all stumbled upon because these caverns are said to be at the confluence of the Little Colorado River with the Colorado River, which is supposed to be an extremely difficult place to get to, very dangerous to repel into. Um, the confluence of those rivers uh, is supposedly very hard to navigate and it would be really tough for somebody to get in there. However, all of this was discovered, I'm doing air quotes, discovered by Mor not only a Mormon, not just any Mormon, but m essentially Mormon royalty, the Tanner family. Anybody who is familiar with John Kelleher's channel will know that he's done a few videos lately linking the guy who goes as Handsome Truth to the Mormon Tanner family. Um, the Mormons have aris uh, aristocratic families. The Tanners is one of them. I would say the biggest gatekeepers, controlled opposition in Mormonism, are the Tanners of Utah. Um, that would be uh, Sandra and uh, her husband, I forget, Jerry, I think, Jerry and Sandra Tanner. I think these are some nefarious people right here. She, Sandra Tanner, is actually a direct descendant of Brigham Young. Now, this stuff was supposedly discovered by a Tanner 
Seth Tanner, that is. It's said that he was sent out that way by Brigham Young. Um, to look for possible other spots for Mormon settlements. Now, how it went from his day and time and his supposed discovery of, of this site up until the early 1900s when these two archaeologists were messing around there and the Phoenix Gazette ran their article in 1909. Um, I'm not sure about that gap necessarily, but Seth Tanner is credited with being the guy who supposedly discovered all of this. Now, there is a few other players uh, that are involved in this, but it is quite interesting when you consider who supposedly discovered this site. Now, I'm, I'm at a web page right now called the Phoenix Enigma. And this guy, even though he upholds some of those, um, those mainstream views about who has lived in the Americas the longest and so on and so forth, he does have a lot of very interesting information on his site. Uh, by the way, one of the multiple wives that Seth Tanner had, because he was a polygamist like pretty much all Mormon men back at that time, uh, was a Hopi. Which right now, this whole site, the reason, one of the reasons it's off limits is because they say it's, uh, it's all special holy land to the Hopi Indians. So from the website, The Phoenix Enigma, concerning Seth Tanner, it says that Tanner was a Mormon pioneer in the mid to late 1800s. He arrived on scene in Salt Lake City in 1848 and bounced between Utah and California, engaging in several business ventures. Um, the Mormons, and specifically Brigham Young, had, um, had his fingers in a lot of what was going on gold-wise in California during his reign over the Mormon church. And that in and of itself is pretty interesting. It says in 1875 he was chosen by Brigham Young to join an exploration party and search out suitable places for settlements along the Little Colorado River located just east of the Grand Canyon where he eventually made his family home near present-day Tuba City. I guess he didn't feel like going back to Salt Lake City, uh, it says on the Navajo Indian Reservation. So he's credited with originally exploring and discovering these sites. There are all of these uh, unsubstantiated legends that the Hopis uh, blinded him uh, for seeing these, these holy sites uh, of theirs. Um, I don't know how they would have considered them theirs because it is said that um, all of the artifacts in there were not Hopi uh, whatsoever, but in quotes, Egyptian. There have been reports of so-called Egyptian artifacts from far before Seth Tanner's time. Um, in fact, the author of this website Interestingly enough, he shows uh, one of, of many boomerangs that have been found as artifacts around that area and other areas as well. Now, something that's kind of strange, who I think is, is a bit more of an interesting character, and there's probably more to be said about him and who he was involved with, and I'm trying to scroll up a little bit here, is this other fellow that had a lot to do with all of these things, named Clarence Dutton. Now, <clears throat> I'll start just before we get to the main meat here. Um, 
this guy who authored this this Phoenix Enigma website he was talking about the reasons that park rangers because he lives near here and he's gone to the Grand Canyon many times so he has a very intimate understanding of the layout of the canyon and its various areas and he says from the south uh, uh, portion of the Grand Canyon which is where uh, most of the tourists are going to go to and they'll, they'll have this lookout point at the south there most of the um, peaks and what he and many 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 others have described as geometric shapes in the rocks uh, out there in the canyons he said it was it's just so interesting that most of the the ones that you can see from the south entrance <clears throat> have Egyptian names and past that there are some that have Hindu names um, like there's there's one structure named um, Isis temple uh, and he, he asked he gives a whole list of, of the names here uh, Sheba temple uh, the tabernacle Rama shrine and then there's Indian names like Vishnu Temple and Krishna Shrine. But from the south entrance, um, most of the structures you see have Egyptian names. And the, the ones to the south were the ones who were named uh, the earliest. He said this, this is some, some reasons the park rangers have given for why uh, these structures have Egyptian names. One said, oh, the pyramids and tombs of Egypt were being explored and excavated at the time the park was being studied. Quite true. Egypt was on everyone's mind, and some of the formations looked like temples or pyramids, so it started a trend. That's a good one. Another ranger said, it was fashionable at the time to name things after Egypt. And yet another said it was Clarence Dutton who named most of the features in the Grand Canyon. Now, that first ranger was is quite right. The funny thing is, the Smithsonian was having a lot of very shady, secret doings in the American West right around the same time that all kinds of interesting things were being found from Egypt to Mesopotamia. This was all happening at the same time. And I find that huh, far more than coincidental. Now this man goes on to say, upon researching Clarence Dutton, it appears he did have much to do with these names. In his book, A Tertiary History of the Grand Canyon District, Dutton put many of the Egyptian and Hindu names to the features and rock stratification found in the park. Later, others inspired by Dutton continued the tradition by following with names from Norse, Greek, Roman mythologies as well as Arthurian legend. Now, continuing on Clarence Dutton. Quite the exceptional man and no doubt deserving of a post of his own on this site, though one would think that our interest in Mr. Clarence Dutton would center only around his choice of names for features within the Grand Canyon, a cursory investigation of this man rings all kinds of Masonic bells. When researching further, I came to learn facts about his life that are quite peculiar, and it appears that Mr. Dutton is very much attached to this mystery indeed. A quick study of Clarence Dutton's life drums up images of Indiana Jones only a bit more refined. Mr. Dutton was a soldier, geologist, and poet. Quite the combination, and one that obviously served him well. He's most known for his work, The Tertiary History of the Grand Canyon District, which today is still the definitive work on the geology of the Grand Canyon. His earlier work, Report on the Geology of the High Plateaus of Utah, most certainly caught the attention of John Powell. Powell became so impressed with Dutton's work, he appointed him head of the Department of Volcanic Geology at the U.S. Geological Survey. Dutton went on to study and write reports on the volcanoes of Hawaii and Crater Lake in Oregon, all 
the while, waxing, his words with poetically infused language. He was a man quite moved by natural beauty and didn't separate his love of geology from that of the written word. While I can find no confirmation that Mr. Dutton was a Freemason, he most certainly had connections with some of the most powerful and well-known people, not only within the scientific community, but uh, people in positions of considerable power, men who were forging a new nation and the frontier of its exploration and development. Dutton graduated from Yale University in 1860 and while attending was regarded as a cultured polymath and raconteur. He was a lover of chess and as well as a skilled gymnast. His senior year he won the Yale Literary Award for an essay he wrote on the novels of Charles Kingsley. In short, he was quite the accomplished young man. Directly out of school, he went on to serve as a first lieutenant for the 21st Connecticut Regiments in the Civil War, where he saw some pretty rough fighting. Dutton was also quite fond of societies, and again, while I can find no proof of connection to Freemasonry, he certainly was a member of many societies at the time, helped, and he helped to create several of them himself. He obviously had a fondness for brotherhood, and no doubt would have kept many friends who were Freemasons. It was not uncommon for a man to be a member of several societies or even secret societies simultaneously in those days. Don't forget he attended Yale. Need I mention the infamous Skull and Bone Society formed at that campus in 1832. The same secret society George Bush Jr. and John Kerry are members of today. Um, by the way, 322 if you multiply 22 times 3, you get 66. Um, anyways, he goes on concerning this man, Dutton, on January 13, 1888. 33 men got together and formed a geographical society. A week later, Charles Dutton sat as chairman of that society and it formalized into the National Geographic Society. This group was made of scientists, adventurers, and explorers, and it also included a journalist and a superintendent from the National Zoo. Dutton rubbed elbows with John Wesley Powell. Now there is a lot to be said about Powell, John Wesley Powell. He was the head of the Smithsonian in the late 1800s. And there's a lot in this book I'm reading about Powell. Um, Powell seemed to be a master uh, propagandist. And uh, he was probably the perfect guy to head up the Smithsonian in the late 1800s. And he was the head of the Smithsonian for a very long time. Um, it says that uh, Dutton was also a member of the Cosmos Club, Philosophical Society, the Geological Society, and a society within the Geographical Society known as the Great Basin Mess. There's a lot of interesting things about the Great Basin. Uh, when you look at the area um, that it's located in, and the amount of national parks in and around that area. Um, he, he says just considering Dutton, um, again he says that, that he can't find any record of Freemasonry in Dutton's life. I find it interesting that the society he helped to create and chaired was founded by 33 men. 33 men of power and influence, 33 being, of course, the highest honorary degree in the Scottish Rite tradition of Freemasonry and found throughout all of said society. Although naysayers will be quick to point out that this proves nothing, I personally don't believe it to simply be a coincidence. In 1888, and this is me, in 1888, 33 men. Now, a number of these guys um, and these institutions are connected with the very institution, which I would say was also a secret society because it was founded in that way, 
are connected with the Royal Geographical Society, which was is part of what is the Royal Society uh, of England, and and they really have been um, the monolith of giving everybody in the modern world their idea and understanding of the world. They are behind uh, all of these supposed archaeological discoveries in the Middle East. Um, he says, until researching this article, I never put together the similarities between the National Geographic Society of the U.S. and the Royal Geographical Society of England. Both began as private societies of learned men and soon after became recognized by their governments. Well, that's how it would seem on the record and in the public eye. He says those governments then recruited and funded the organizations to explore new lands for national imperialism and military superiority. Ah, on one hand, these societies considered of a group of scientists pushing the limits of their respective fields, while on the other they were often doing so in the capacity of their government. The movie Raiders of the Lost Ark plays on this very idea when Dr. Jones is recruited to retrieve the Ark of the Covenant on behalf of the U.S. government before the National Socialists find it first. My question is, how can anyone expect the discoveries of any government-sanctioned expedition to be transparent when the nature of government is intrinsically secretive to begin with? And I agree. I absolutely agree. He recounts a, an incident that happened at a store he worked at. Uh, a, a number of the things he goes over on this portion of his site, which is much bigger than just this thing with the Grand Canyon and those caverns with the so-called Egyptian artifacts. <clears throat> but he does relay something that he says, you know, can't be chalked up as speculation whatsoever. He worked in a, a store that rented and sold gear to people hiking or going on expeditions in the Grand Canyon. And he says, uh, it was in 1991, he was in high school, um, and he worked in an outfitter shop in North Phoenix, specialized in backpacking, prospecting, rock climbing gear. He was in charge of the rental gear, uh, getting it cleaned up and ready to be rented out again. He said, the owner and I used to speak regularly about the Grand Canyon mystery as he had extensive experience below the rim and had hiked quite a bit of the canyon at one time or another. And while he had never come across any caves personally, he found the whole story quite interesting. Now, he said, I moved on about a year later and ended up locating uh, to <laughs> Wiki up Arizona. We kept in touch, him and the owner of that store, over the next 10 years, periodically touched on the topic. Sometime around 2007, I stopped in to see my friend to catch up on desert stories and found him eager to speak with me. He said the strangest thing had just happened the week prior, in 2007. He said that representatives from the Grand Canyon National Park came to see him and placed an order for gear. All that, although they wouldn't say what they were doing, they placed a massive order for 24 harnesses, 24 helmets, 24 headlamps, backup batteries, backup flashlights, etc., and rope 6,000 feet of static line, ascending and repelling devices, and so forth. Now, rope comes in two flavors, dynamic for climbing, and static or working line for hauling, repelling, ascending, etc. He said that they were going to come back in the next few weeks to pick up the order. FYI, 6,000 feet of static line is epic. That's literally over a mile of rope. All in all, the order came out to around $28,000. He asked what them what they were doing with so much gear, but they were politely evasive, and he got no further information out of them. 
What's interesting is this is actually right around the same time that after 10 years of really an epic battle between many different factions, an extremely bogus uh, number of reports by, as far as I'm concerned, establishment tools were released concerning Kennewick Man. Although Kennewick Man was discovered in around the mid 90s, around 96, and initial reports said all kinds of fascinating things about Kennewick Man which I'm going to get into in another video because I'll put out of course another video on this <clears throat> because these items are of such great interest concerning America American history and all of the cover-ups all of the energy all of the time all of the money that so many institutions linked with the government and thus linked with the money powers in the United States and we all know who that is um, they have put so much energy and effort into covering up and as I said stealing land <clears throat> that of course they want to chalk up as protecting it from the people of this country and we have to ask ourselves why and why the Americas aren't all over in the travel histories of pretty much every nation in the world these are important questions to ask and as I said this is one of the reasons I started researching the Mormons and Mormonism because of some of the the shady things that they were involved with very early on um, and of course who it was that was first doing quote-unquote business in the Americas back in the 1400s at least and who was propag propagandizing the Americas in certain specific ways from the 1600s on there is so much to the Americas and specifically North America that hold the key to world history that we really have to explore as many pertinent items as we can <clears throat> the Grand Canyon caves are one there are a few people who have done some really amazing videos concerning the Grand Canyon if I can I will put links to those videos in the description um, people noticing things like aerial photos of the Grand Canyon and how there are massive massive um, camouflage nets set up in certain particular areas of the Grand Canyon essentially put there to hide things um, so I'll try to check for those things uh, and get those links to those other videos some of them you might have to watch more than listen to I know I try to gear most of my videos to where they're just listenable um, but hopefully I can get those in uh, because they're from some pretty obscure channels I mean one channel I think the only they only have two videos and one of them is about this connection with uh, Egyptian artifacts and like I said most people out there they're just gonna either just be programmed to think this way to think that okay even if they have an alternative viewpoint they're still going to tow that that sort of old chestnut that believes that it was uh, the various tribes which the other thing we're going to look at is how diverse some of these tribes were um, they kind of believe that it was always these various tribes and that they were just visited by peoples from other areas and I'm here to tell you that I don't believe that to be the case whatsoever that one of the peoples 
who lived here in great mass was a very advanced civilization of quote unquote white folks. And there's a lot of reasons to this. And I'm just going to get into some of the um, alternate archaeological and historical reasons for us to question everything that we think we know about America. So I'll do another video on this subject here very soon. Uh, as I'm way too in the middle of, of, of other things to present anything concerning those. So this is a great, interesting uh, topic, which I've got some very good materials on. So I'll see you again soon uh, concerning these things. And I always look forward to, uh, to hearing from you guys in the comments. So uh, until that next one, everybody, take care. Bye.